Thank you and good afternoon. I'm conscious that I am the only thing standing between you and your lunch, so I won't prolong this unnecessarily. Um, just the facts. So if I could just um, perhaps spend a little time telling you a little bit more about what we are and who we are. Uh, we are a listed A-REIT. We have an active business in retail funds management. I co-founded the business in 1998 and um, it's taken 15 years to be an overnight success. But in that time, we spent a number of years building up a retail funds management business, raising about a billion dollars from smaller investors, small superannuation funds, until 2006 when we saw that the market was becoming fairly fully priced and we wanted to provide an opportunity for our investors to gain some liquidity. So we stapled the business to our funds in 2006 and we did a lot of unfashionable things in that time, at that time. For those of you who remember, it was very unfashionable to sell assets at a profit. It was very unfashionable to pay down debt. It was unfashionable not to have a long development pipeline and for Australian REITs, it was unfashionable to stay on shore. But we did all of those things, principally because we believed in the discipline of doing what we knew well. And we didn't want to do things simply because they were fashionable or because analysts told us that we should move with the herd. But the result of all of that was that we maintained a very strong reputation in the retail funds management sector. And we were well placed when the market turned and coming into the GFC. And as a result of that placement at that time, we were one of the very few REITs in the world that didn't have to undertake a dilutionary capital raising, that had the support of its banks, and that was able to grow. And we grew very strongly from and through the GFC with the support of some of our shareholders. We've undertaken a number of capital raisings at or above NTA. We've applied the proceeds accretively and we've grown the business. I think one of the key reasons for our success has been that we are internally managed. Unlike a number of other REITs in Australia, we're not managed by a third party. We have a strong level of identity and alignment of interests between management and our investors. We've kept a very strong management team together for a long period of time. Because of the way we were placed, we were able to attract and retain very good talent in the early to mid-2000s. We kept the team intact because we had a strong business during the GFC. <clears throat> Not only are we internally managed, but we have in-house management. Now, the distinction for us is that, unlike a number of other REITs, we don't farm out rent collection or property management to real estate firms. There's no conflict of interest in leasing premises. We have a very strong alignment of interest not only with our investors, but also with our tenants. Our property portfolio is spread throughout the eastern seaboard, in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra, with smaller holdings in Adelaide and Tasmania. Our property portfolio is generally directed at the office sector. That's where we think the best possible returns are likely to come in the, in the short to medium term. As I'll come to later, we're very focused on assets as the building blocks of a business rather than a portfolio. As it stands today, we've got a reasonably balanced allocation to Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Canberra. That's not as a result of any fixed design, it's as a result of a focus on the value of particular assets in those particular markets. <clears throat> we believe very strongly in cash flow and it'll be a constant theme of this presentation that the value of property in our eyes is the cash that it throws, up, throws off. We focus very strongly on the strength of covenants of our tenants, the quality of forward cash flow, and the quality of forward reviews. 
We like buying properties that have governments or very strong tenants, very strong covenant tenants, very large listed companies. As a result of that, we have a very low level of arrears. Our cash flows, we think, are about the strongest in the sector. We also lock in very strong rental growth. About 70% of our portfolio is subject to fixed reviews. Now, you will have heard from a number of other speakers, I think, <clears throat> about the relatively weak business conditions in Australia at the moment. In, in establishing our portfolio of assets, we focused very strongly on ensuring that we've got a bridge, a cash bridge, through any period of softness into a time when we might see further growth. That cash bridge is established by having a very low level of expiries, long lease terms and fixed reviews. Our strategy is somewhat different from others. As I've said earlier, our focus is on cash, cash and cash. We don't necessarily chase assets that look good on the front of an annual review, an annual report or in the paper. You won't find us, find us focused on Sydney CBD assets or Melbourne CBD assets as a number of our peers do because they think they're safe. The reality is those sorts of assets are bought on very tight cap rates. They show generally relatively low total return over a period of time. And generally they're riskier. It's very difficult to get long cash commitments in those types of assets. We prefer to buy well in markets that from time to time may not be as sexy, but buy buildings that have the fundamental property of being able to generate a long cash flow for a long period of time from a strong tenant. We also differ from our peers in one other significant respect, and that is we don't hold assets from cradle to grave. We believe that, you know, if the underlying value in property is land, at a point in time when the building's obsolete, it'll return to its land value. Our philosophy is to suck the best possible years of cash flow out of an asset and recycle it. So you'll find us recycling assets and recycling capital far more actively than a number of our peers. A lot of our peers will hold through the cycle. We prefer to sell when an asset is likely to be, have reached and exceeded its peak years of cash flow. We like to recycle that capital into assets that will be strong generators of cash in the future. That differentiated strategy has provided us with an opportunity for outperformance, which we've demonstrated over time. We believe that you're far better to buy an asset if you're focusing on total return on the basis that you're going to get most of that return from cash flow rather than capital gain. We're regularly presented with 10-year DCF analyses. I'm yet to meet a valuer who can tell me what the terminal value of an asset is in 10 years' time with any degree of precision. We'd rather have a pretty certain level of 10 years' worth of cash flow than bank on a capital gain. We leverage our very strong internal funds management business by providing management services to retail investors. It has been a very profitable business for us. It's not the main driver of our business, but it does two things. It makes it very cheap for us to run a very high quality management business and it provides additional sources of cash flow. Our retail funds management business goes back to the core of what we created in 1998. It generates, on average, about a 25 to 35 per cent return on capital employed. We syndicate assets that don't fit on our balance sheet. 
there's no competition and investment strategy, and we're able to generate a very good cash return for very little risk and very little capital outlay. We couple our very strong asset strategy with a very disciplined capital management strategy. We've always had very strong relationships with our lenders. We silo our debt into specific assets or asset pools. We are not reliant on any particular lender and we maintain a reasonably strong level of debt maturity. Our strategy is to gear up when assets are cheap and pay down debt when assets get expensive. It seems to be a relatively novel strategy in our sector, but it works very well. We carried higher levels of leverage and gearing at the bottom of the market and that enabled us to buy assets well. We paid down debt at the top of the market, risk-proofing the business and providing us with a springboard for further opportunity. As I said earlier, we're probably one of the very few REITs in the world that has consistently raised capital at or above net tangible asset value over the last four years. We've been able to apply that capital accretively to buy very high quality assets with very high quality cash flows. We've coupled that ability to raise capital with a very active recycling plan. Now, the results of those strategies have been that we've demonstrated consistent outperformance against the market over a one, three, five and ten year period. We've consistently outperformed the A-REIT accumulation index and over one, three and five years we've demonstrated outperformance of nearly 22%, 6.5% and 15.2%. We're in the top quartile of managers rated by IPD since the inception of that rating in 1999. And in large part due to our active management, we've always demonstrated outperformance in returns. I think what that says is we're cheap. We're currently returning on a distribution basis about 125 points higher than our peer group. We think we do that with a much lower risk profile. Having longer term leases and quality tenants, we think represents the best quality risk adjusted return on equity in the current environment. <clears throat> now you've heard from other speakers where the market is at the present time and it's true there is relative softness in business conditions in Australia at the present time. We're seeing softening rents, softening demand, Fortunately, we're seeing relatively muted supply in most markets because it's very difficult to get the capital necessary to get pre-commitment uh, and pre-commitment to build new buildings. But what we're seeing is a significant influx of capital into the Australian direct property market and into the REIT sector. More than 55% of the market cap of all REITs is held by offshore investors in Australia. In the last six months alone, there's been about $3 billion worth of sales in the direct market to offshore investors. This comes at a time where institutional investors in Australia are charging their, changing their portfolio weightings to invest more into property. It's coming at a time when retail investors are looking to invest more into property. And we're seeing as a result of that, cap rate compression and increasing prices. Now that's curious in circumstances where the fundamentals aren't there to support it, but it's a reality of life. And we think we're going to see quite strong cap rate compression over the next 12 months because Australian yields are significantly higher than in most other markets and the margin between the risk-free rate or interest rates in Australia and cap rates is at an historical high. We're seeing very strong demand in the office sector. 
a lot of that demand is flowing through into core prime investment assets. And what we've seen over the last six months is that most offshore investment focuses on the regional shopping centres, the CBD assets in Sydney and Melbourne, and it hasn't yet trickled down to that secondary asset level. That's where we see the opportunity and that's where we see the value because we believe there'll be greater relative cap rate compression in that part of the market than there will be in the prime market. There's better potential for upside in those assets as investment funds continue to be deployed in Australia. As I mentioned earlier, we couple our strong portfolio investments with an active funds management business. It provides us with an opportunity to leverage the internal skills and platform that we have, derive income, and to reduce the overall operating cost of an in-house model. We've currently got about $822 million under external management, and we focus largely on retail investors. Because of our retail heritage, we have about 12,000 security holders on the register. Many of those continue to invest in our direct retail products. We have over 20,000 20, qualified potential investors, 4,000 of which currently invest in our products. Largely our network has been created organically, but because of that rising demand from retail investors nationally in property products, we're finding a significantly higher level of interest from advisors and platforms for investments in our product. We see the opportunity to strongly grow this business in the next 12 to 24 months. You might ask why we focus on retail investment. And we're one of the very few REITs that do this. Most seek to leverage skills by deriving development income or through wholesale investment. The reason for us is fundamental. Retail investment is so strong in Australia. There are nearly half a million self-managed super funds which have between them about $136 billion in cash and term deposits. Now, you would have been following the recent developments with interest rate settings in Australia. The average self-managed super fund investor relies on the income from their investments to live. When they go to the bank manager after rolling over a three-year term and find that their interest rates have gone from 5% to 3%, they look for alternative investments. And that's happening increasingly in our market. Increasingly, they're looking for investments that produce higher returns. Unfortunately, they will over time invest in riskier assets, probably have limited regard for risk, and many of them will invest in the wrong products. We've got to that inflection point, though, where cash is coming from bank account deposits into property, into alternative investments. And as a result of what happened during the GFC, when most of our peers in that part of the market have either gone broke or discontinued their businesses, we find ourselves as one of the very few credible operators in that sector with a strong track record and with access to product. The future growth drivers for the business are our built-in escalations on our rental, which when coupled with our very low level of expiries in the next three years, give us a high level of certainty to earnings accretion over the next three-year period. Continuing growth and activity from our funds management business, particularly as cash continues to flow from bank accounts, from deposit accounts into property. Continuing reductions in the cost of debt. Now we're seeing not only a fall in swap rates and in bank interest rate, bank fixed rates, but also in margins. It's possible for us with the cost of debt to buy accretively, and we think that's likely to continue for the next 12 months. You can be sure that our continuing focus will be 
on maximising cash flow to our security holders. Our operating earnings this year will be 7.5 cents. Distributions, 7.25 cents. And we look to grow that in 2014. We see upside in our NTA as valuations recognise what's happening in the market. And we look to generate savings in our debt costs over the next one to two years. Having been dominated by retail investors on our register for the last, for many of the last seven years, it's been a focus to improve institutional representation on our register. We've done that successfully over the last few years, resulting in ASX 300 inclusion, and we're hoping with increased levels in trading activity to knock on the door of the 200 index, which we believe will provide a further impetus for share price growth. I thank you for your attention today. Happy to answer any questions if there are any.